two days of Rosh Hashanah are two of the most important days in the year. Of course, they're festival days, they're days of holiday, but they're also days dedicated to prayer. We hear a hundred blasts of the shofar, and it's a day that we try to strike a careful balance between celebration, between joy and festivities, and trepidation of the Day of Judgment. Now, every year we try to tackle a different angle of the festival. And this year, I want to look at the myriad customs and ceremonies and rituals and practices of Rosh Hashanah to learn about their significance, to learn about the lessons contained within them, to learn about the various activities that we do to get in the right frame of mind for this Rosh Hashanah, the day of judgment and the beginning of the days of repentance and the days of awe. So, of course, in Judaism, preparation always begins before the main event. In fact, our sages tell us to the degree that someone prepares for something and gets in a state of spiritual readiness for something, that's the degree to which they're able to absorb the power and the lessons within that particular day. So of course, Rosh Hashanah, a week before Rosh Hashanah, a month before Rosh Hashanah, we already begin getting ready for these days. So of course, throughout the month of Elul, the month preceding Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar after Shachris. So after the morning prayers, for 30 days before Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar. Moreover, twice a day, at the end of the prayers, there is a special psalm that we read that has a lot of the themes of the high holidays today within it, and that is Psalms number 27, and that already begins the whole month of Elul. Some people have a custom to recite psalms in general throughout the month of Elul. Some have a custom, in fact, to do 10 chapters a day. Another ubiquitous custom is to begin when greeting people, or let's say writing a letter, which is a quaint thing people do in the past before emails. When you write it, you sign it off and say, or you, you, you bless the person that they should have a great Rosh Hashanah and a happy, healthy, sweet new year. Moreover, this is a time when we are told to be extra fastidious in mitzvot and Torah and charity. Some have a custom, in fact, to even take their tefillin and their mezuzos off their doorpost and to send it to the scribe to have a check just to make sure everything's great. We want to spiritually tidy up before the end of the year. Now, in Sephardic communities, they begin reciting the Selichos, or the Selichot, a month before Rosh Hashanah, so the beginning of Elo, they do it every night, some do it in the morning, some do it at night. Ashkenazi communities, they start Selichot the Saturday night before Rosh Hashanah, provided that Rosh Hashanah starts Wednesday or later in the week. So this year, 2020, Rosh Hashanah is on Shabbos, so we started actually last night. And the custom is, or the general custom is, that from when Selichot start until you finish them, you do them essentially in the mornings. But the first day of Selichot, you do it at night, and you wait till after Halachic midnight. So last night, starting at 1.30 in the morning, we got together in shul and we did the slichos. So if I'm bleary eyed and tired and a little bit garbled, a little bit slow, you know what to blame it on. So we're starting to prepare for Rosh Hashanah way, way, way in advance. And again, these practices are part of halacha, part of common custom. And then we get to the last week of the year. And there's an interesting ancient Kabbalistic concept that the last 
item in a list or the last event in a given time frame that is going to encapsulate, so to speak, the entirety of the time frame. Meaning that the last week of the year is extra auspicious to be able to rectify the year that it is concluding. So for example, if someone has an amazing last Sunday of the year and they're behaving properly, they're doing everything correctly, they're living the way they aspire to live. So Kabbalistically, we're told that that actually rectifies all the Sundays of the previous year. You have a great Monday, it fixes all the Mondays, etc. And that way the last week of the year is a great opportunity to end off the year with a bang. And the way it ends is almost the way it gets classified, it gets logged in heaven. Now the final Shabbos of the year, the Shabbos before Rosh Hashanah, we always read Parshas Nitzavim. Now this year, most years we read Nitzavim and Bayelach together, but Parshas Nitzavim is always read before Rosh Hashanah. And the reason for that is that this Parsha contains many of the themes of repentance. In fact, the bulk of the Parsha talks about repentance. And therefore, it was designed, the calendar was designed in a way that this critical subject, which is highly topical to the themes of Rosh Hashanah, is read in every Jewish community the Shabbos preceding Rosh Hashanah. Now, there's an interesting oddity about this particular month. Of course, we know the Jewish calendar. We have a lunar monthly calendar. And we have a solar calendar year. So it's a little confusing. Everything works out. All the calculations are already done. We don't need to worry about those calculations. But it is interesting that there is a process through which a new month is inaugurated. So if you go to Shul, the Shabbos preceding Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh is the first day of the month. So there is an announcement, there's a ceremony that is done in the shul where we proclaim the day of the Rosh Chodesh. This, you know, has its roots in a time when the Sanhedrin was still extant, that the Sanhedrin will be in charge of overseeing the inauguration of new month, the inauguration of new moons and new months. And of course, we're going to have Sanhedrin today. But nevertheless, we still declare in Shul the Shabbos preceding Rosh Chodesh, the Shabbos preceding the first day of a new of a new lunar month. That oh, you should know, you know, on Tuesday or Tuesday and Wednesday, sometimes it's it's two days or on Friday, whatever day of the week it is, we're going to have Rosh Chodesh. There's one exception, and that is the month of Tishrei, because the first day of the month of Tishrei is also. Rosh Hashanah. And it's odd, 11 out of 12 months a year, and 12 out of 13 months a year when there's a leap year, meaning there's an extra month to accommodate for the discrepancy between the solar year and the lunar month. 11 out of 12, we do make an announcement, whereas the Shabbos before Rosh Hashanah, we don't make the announcement in Shul. So the Baal Shem Tov says an amazing Hasidic idea, Kabbalistic idea. He says, truth is, there is an announcement that's made on Shabbos preceding Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the month of Tishrei. It's just not a human announcement. The Almighty, so to speak, descends to this world and is in our proximity. And he himself makes the declaration, you should know that this new month, which is going to coincide with Rosh Hashanah, is going to be on this end, this day. And during this time of year, the Almighty is close and he's around us. So we are in his proximity, so to speak. 
and therefore it's such powerful days, the rest of the year, we have to make that announcement ourselves. But on this month, the Umani does it for us. Now, the day before Rosh Hashanah, there are some slight differences. So first of all, as you know, we start the slichos, and that is done before the prayers every day, the longest slichos are the day before Rosh Hashanah. However, despite the fact that the entire month of Elul, we have been blowing the shofar after the prayer, the day before Rosh Hashanah, we don't blow the shofar. And the reason for this is that we want to differentiate between the shofar that is a custom and the shofar that is a biblical commandment. There is a biblical commandment to blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. And it's a very nice custom. It's a very ubiquitous custom. It's a very ancient custom to blow the shofar throughout the month of Elul, but it's not a mitzvah that appears in the Torah. And therefore, in order to not get the impression that this is just one long process of blowing the shofar every day, we have this break, Erev Rosh Hashanah, day before Rosh Hashanah, we don't blow the shofar in shul. Now, there's another interesting custom that, again, is ubiquitous, that's done on the day before Rosh Hashanah, and that is what's called the annulment of vows. What that means is, we know there's a portion of the Torah talks about vows. A person can make a declaration and a vow and create a 614th mitzvah. If someone makes a declaration, behold, I make a vow that I am not going to eat this, this food. That food, again, provided the vow is done in, within the constraints of halacha, that food now becomes prohibited to that person as if it was in the Torah. This is very dangerous stuff. The reason why this is very dangerous stuff is because there is a big difference between how we view vows and how God views vows, how the Torah views vows. In our head, you know, when someone says something, words are trivial. They don't matter that much. It's not real. However, in the Torah, the Torah tells us that words have transformative powers to create new mitzvahs. And therefore, if someone makes a vow and treats it as being not so important, the Torah views it as very important. And therefore, right before Rosh Hashanah, we want to make sure that we don't have any vows that we haven't fulfilled. So there's a process through which we annul the vows and we have a court and the court's there and the matrix of the vows are erased so we can walk into Rosh Hashanah free and clear without any vows in our spiritual responsibility. Now, it's interesting, Yom Kippur as well, the first prayer that we say in Yom Kippur is kol nidre, all the vows. So we start off Rosh Hashanah, the day before Rosh Hashanah, an moment of vows, and then we have a public communal disavowal of vows, a moment of vows, with Kol Nidre, that kitsch starts Yom Kippur. Now, in general, our sages tell us that speech is the essential element of humanity. What makes humans interesting and noteworthy is the fact that we are a fusion of opposites. Our soul is the holiest thing in the world. Our body is the least holy thing in the world. And those two are fused together. But what makes man? What makes a human? It's not just a collection of opposites. It's something new. It's a fusion of that two. That fusion, the touch point between body and soul, between spiritual and physical, is our speech. And therefore, when someone corrupts their speech, God forbid, they're corrupting their essence. And therefore, all sins, so to speak, of speech are very harsh and severe and draconian 
in Torah law. And one of the worst of them, of course, is Lashon Hara. We talk about that a lot. But a vow would fall into this category. And therefore, therefore, Shoshana, we try to expunge all our vows, get rid of it, we could go into the new year without any vows on our plate. Someone doesn't do it in time, you can rely on Kol Nidre, because that is this catch-all where we're annulling the vows of everyone in the community. There are other customs that are done on Erev Rosh Hashanah, the day before Rosh Hashanah. There is a ubiquitous custom for people to go to the mikvah, to the ritual uh, bath, to kind of spiritually cleanse themselves before Rosh Hashanah. We're told to try to get in the zone, get in the mode of Rosh Hashanah with introspection, thinking about what we need to pray for Rosh Hashanah, think about what we need to work on on Rosh Hashanah. If there's someone that we have wronged, don't wait till the last minute before we for ask forgiveness ahead of time. It's a custom to give charity. And we also made sure, despite the fact that this is the scariest day of the year, it's a day of judgment. Every human is brought before God and evaluated. Isn't that terrifying? Despite the fact that it's the scariest day of the year, we're told in the halacha, it's important to shower. It's important to get a haircut, to shave, dress in your finest clothing. Why? Because it's a festival. And we are confident that we have the Almighty in our corner. And yes, we're on trial. And yes, it's a capital case. And yes, who knows if we're going to succeed, we're going to be exculpated, if we're going to emerge victorious, acquitted in the judgment of Rosh Hashanah. But we kind of have this sense that the Almighty is with us. And therefore, it's a day of celebration. It is a holiday. Now, the last prayer of the year is the Mincha, the afternoon prayer, right before Rosh Hashanah starts. And again, like we mentioned earlier, the last month of the year, the last week of the year, the last day of the year, the last prayer of the year, these are days and opportunities to allow us to put our stamp, so to speak, on the year that we're closing out. And therefore, our sages tell us already in ancient literature that on this particular prayer, all the prayers, so to speak, of the preceding year can all be fixed via this one last prayer of the year. So yes, it's not Rosh Hashanah yet. It's Arab Rosh Hashanah, it's Mincha time, it's the afternoon preceding Rosh Hashanah, but it's the final prayer of the year, and therefore, let's make the most of it. And then we start Rosh Hashanah. And again, our sages talk about this idea a lot, how there are two almost opposing feelings that we have in Rosh Hashanah. We have the joy, we have the trepidation, we have the celebration, the festivities, and we have the awe of being in the day of judgment, of having our audition in front of God. So we have the prayer of Rosh Hashanah at night, and after the prayer is over, there is a traditional greeting that is done to everyone that you meet, people in the synagogue, in your family, before you have the festive meal, and that is the greeting of Shana Tova. You are greeting people to have a happy year, a sweet year, a healthy year, a productive year, a prosperous year. And there's actually a longer version of that where we hope and we pray and we greet someone that they should be written in the book of life and they should be stamped in the book of life, but not just any life, fantastic, wonderful, splendid life. When I was in yeshiva, one of the yeshivas that I was in, on Rosh Hashanah night, the first night of Rosh Hashanah, after every prayer, every Shabbos prayer, the custom was that 
students would kind of file, make a line and, and, and file in front of the Rosh Hashiva who was there and just to greet him, give him a, you know, a Shabbos greeting. And that was every week. But in Rosh Hashanah, he would speak to every student individually. And this is a small boutique yeshiva, maybe 150 or so students. But he would speak to like you know, two minutes to each student, which is a lot of time. I mean, maybe not two minutes. I don't know. It was, uh, it was a lot of time. It would take hours. And people just wait in line. And what he would do is he would say, you know, this is Rosh Hashanah. And he would, he would give you, he would give you like compliments. You know, he would tell you where your strengths are. He would tell you what the opportunities are. He would tell you if he's proud of you or not. And that is, again, in line with this idea that we're supposed to greet people and have a very positive, positive sentiments on the day of Rosh Hashanah. So we finished prayer and we've greeted all our friends and our neighbors and we've tried to have this very positive outlook and sentiments and now we have the feast. And this is a very unusual banquet. Of course, every Shabbos we're supposed to have celebration and we're supposed to have a festive meal and every festival as well, of course, but there's something unique about Rosh Hashanah dinners and that is that there are lots of foods that we eat special foods that we eat that have symbolic importance for the year upcoming and by the way this is not a new thing it sounds kind of new age it's found in the talmud it's ancient so some of the things that people traditionally do they dip the apple in the honey it's apple super sweet and we dip it in the honey. In fact, I always say that I, I eat an apple twice a year. First night of Rosh Hashanah, second night of Rosh Hashanah. And then, and then there's the pomegranates and dates, and some people eat leeks or beets, black-eyed peas, squash, fish, head of fish, head of lamb even, carrots, and there are many such foods. Now, traditionally, when people do this, they also make a declaration. And the declaration has something to do with the thing that we are doing, we are eating. So we dip the apple in the honey and you pray before God, may it be your will, our God, the God of our forefathers, that you renew for us a good and sweet year. We have double sweetness. We got the honey, we got the apples and we dip it in and we make that declaration. And every one of these foods we make a declaration that is fitting for that particular food. Now, it is interesting. It's kind of a very strange custom. But it is interesting. We think about the, the first Rosh Hashanah. So we know, of course, Rosh Hashanah does not mark the day where God created the world, not day one of Genesis, but instead it's day six of Genesis, when God created Adam. And therefore, that's the day when everything really gets started because everything else was just preparatory. When Adam's created, okay, now God has someone who could coronate him. And now the purpose, the goal of creation is being fulfilled, is being implemented. But if you think about that story, what else happened in that day? Of course, it's the creation of man. It's the day of the recreation of man. It was the day that, that God, it was the day that God was finally coronated by Adam. And therefore, it's the day that we, too, coronate God. But what else happened that day? According to our sages, that same day is the day that Adam and Eve did the sin of eating from the fruit of the tree of knowledge, good and bad. And that day they were booted from the garden. And isn't it interesting that this is the day where the most transformational sin, which involved eating your fruit, was done? And we're told already in the Talmud that this is a, that this is a day that we're supposed to eat fruits as well. It seems to me that these fruits are somewhat connected. Adam 
sinned by not obeying the will of God via eating a fruit. And that, of course, unleashes a series of events that changed humanity. Adam's booed from the garden. Adam gets a Yetzirah. Adam condemned humanity to live a finite life. And of course, there's some good things that came out of that. Now we have a Yetzirah. The only way for us to extricate ourselves from that is via Torah. So Adam's sin, in this perverse way, caused us to get the Almighty's Torah. But we could simplify and say, well, our life mission is to try to revert back to the state of mankind before the sin, to try to undo the sin of Adam and Eve and its consequences. That's what our life mission is. And when did that start? It started in Rosh Hashanah. And this is the day that we make sure that we are properly calibrated in our life mission. We think about what's really important in our life. What are we living for? And we symbolize part of this by eating fruit. We recognize that this day can be the counter to that other fruit which brought humanity such misery. We dip the apple in the honey. Traditionally, we also dip the challah in the honey. Our sages point out that honey is an outlier food. Normally, if you get something, if there's if something that derives from a non-kosher source, that itself is non-kosher. So if you have a, a vulture, it's a non-kosher bird, and it lays an egg, I assume it lays an egg. I don't know. I assume so. Is that egg kosher? It's not kosher because it comes from a non-Jewish source. Pig milk, not kosher. And yet we have a bee. The bee is not kosher. And yet the honey that derives from the bee is kosher. And therefore what honey symbolizes is this ability to take something kosher and holy and bring it out of a non-kosher and unholy source. Moreover, we know that the bee is a villain. Whenever you see a bee, you're like, oh no, is he gonna bite me? Is he gonna sting me? And this summer we were in Canada and there was a, a beehive that was on the cottage wall. So the entire summer, I was committing genocide against all these bees. Every time there was a bee around that called me, I pulled my shoe, I would chase the bees, knock them down. And a bunch of our kids got bee bites. So when you think of a bee, it's like scary, it's gonna bite me, it's gonna hurt me. And yet what comes out of it? Out of this villain comes something so pleasant and sweet. Moreover, there's a very interesting, unusual halacha about, about honey. And that is that whatever falls into it gets subsumed into the honey and becomes kosher. So theoretically, if a piece of pork drops into a pot of honey, it could eventually become honey itself and become kosher. That's what our sages tell us. So there's something really powerful and transformative about honey. And these are all indicative of Rosh Hashanah. It's a day of transformation. It's a day of change. It's a day when the things that are bad can become good. The things that are harmful can become delicious and sweet. And whatever is thrown into it, no matter what it is, can emerge kosher and delicious. The Shakers tell us that Sarah was incapable of having children. She was infertile. But something changed on Rosh Hashanah. The, so to speak, non-kosher became kosher. The infertile became fertile. And of course, we read the story of Sarah's birth on Rosh Hashanah itself. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, same thing. She too was infertile, incapable of, of having children. But something changed on Rosh Hashanah. 
we can be in a state of complete bad, like the non-kosher menace the bee and become sweet and delicious on Rosh Hashanah. We were created in Rosh Hashanah. And every year we get created anew on Rosh Hashanah. But the insight is that we have a say into how we are going to be recreated. So we dip things into honey and we hope and pray that just as the honey provides total transformation, so too may our Rosh Hashanah provide that same benefit. Now, there's a custom to eat a head of a fish. Some even have a head of a lamb. In my life, I've never had any one of those. But the declaration that you say when you do that, let us be a head and not a tail. We want to be at the vanguard of humanity. That, of course, is our national mission. But we have this touch point with that idea at Rosh Hashanah. Moreover, when someone is a tail, they're looking back at the tail. It's looking back at the past. It's regret. Maybe this declaration, let's be a head not a tail, that is reminding us to maximize the opportunity that we have in Rosh Hashanah so that we don't look back in the future and say, oh, I regret not seizing the moment. Now, there is a custom to not just subsist with the various special foods of the Talmudic era, the honey and the black-eyed peas, etc., but we are encouraged to make up our own good omens. So a famous one that people used to say is they would take lettuce and they would take uh, a half a raisin and they would take celery and they would say, you know, just like when you say the, the prayers in Hebrew for those particular foods and you say, oh, you know, the sheyikarsu the, soneinu because there's a word in there that has the same Hebraic root as the food you're eating, they do the same thing in English. So they take lettuce and half a raisin and celery, and they eat it. And they say, maybe your will, let us have a raisin and celery. Did you hear that? Let us have a raisin, celery. Let us have a raisin, celery. Last year, my kids came up with a new one. The soup was kind of creamy and, uh, and rich. So may we all become super rich. And then my brother-in-law told me a new one. He's taking his bar exam. So he's all nervous about the bar. So he wants to make pasta and a chocolate bar. And he say, let us pass the bar, pass the bar, pass the bar. And that was his idea. I heard one um, in Rosh Hashanah of 2019. I heard a new one. It's a little bit controversial, but I think everyone here can handle it. They put a mint in a peach and they were really hoping to achieve impeachment of the president. I don't know how that, how, how that worked out, but there was this idea that we're supposed to kind of get in the zone and everything we're doing the entire day, the entire two days of Rosh Hashanah are all there trying to get us in the right frame of mind. We're being judged today and we're hoping and we're praying and we're a little bit confident that we're going to end up well. We have the mind in our corner. But because this is the day to kickstart the year upcoming, it's very important to maintain a great spirit on Rosh Hashanah, not to get angry not to get irritated, not to make a big deal when things don't go smoothly, not to react when kids make messes, to be pleasant, to be kind, and to be sweet. And that will set the tone for the year to come. We want to make a shining example of this day. 
So, of course, on Rosh Hashanah Day itself, it's a very long prayer. And we're told that we're being judged and what's going to happen to us in this upcoming year is determined on Rosh Hashanah. How much income we're going to make, how, how much success we'll have, our health, etc. Now it is interesting that we still pray for those things every day. And you kind of wonder, well, if it's already declared ahead of time on Rosh Hashanah, what is going to be our lot for this year upcoming? Why do we need to pray every single day for it? Whatever was determined in Rosh Hashanah was determined in Rosh Hashanah. And the answer is that in Rosh Hashanah, we're pulling down, so to speak, all the blessing, all the bounty, all the vitality for the year. But that's placed in escrow. And then every day when we do a prayer, it's, so to speak, trying to draw down from the escrow account for this year. We want daily withdrawal, so to speak, of life, of health, of prosperity and vitality every single day. Now, in antiquity, people used to refrain from praying for personal needs on Rosh Hashanah. Because Rosh Hashanah, after all, is the day of coronation of God. And it's improper, people used to say, to pray for your own small, petty needs on Rosh Hashanah. Pray for God. Pray for transformation in the world. And you know what? Once you have a close relationship with God, of course you'll have prosperity and health and all that. That's what people used to say in antiquity. However, it's already been three, four, five hundred years that our sages have unanimously told us that that's the incorrect way. Today, we have to realize that without prosperity and health and goodness in every part of our lives, we really can't be proper servants of God. And therefore, we have to pray that we are given livelihood and prosperity and health on Rosh Hashanah. And there's nothing wrong for someone to pray for that, even though, again, the times of the Talmud was different. Today's a day that all the blessing is going to be determined. That's what we believe. The Almighty is going to be dispensing the year to come's blessing. And therefore, the reason why we have so much prayer is because this is the day you want to make your requests in. Once you miss it, it's too late. You can never have that opportunity again. So yes, a lot of people have a hard time praying for that long. And I remember as a kid, always looking, you know, how many more pages do we have left? We're up to page 36, and it's page 512 before we're done, before we go home. So that, I think, is quite natural. <coughs> Excuse me. But when we realize that this is a day that is designed for us to get the most out of the year upcoming, it makes sense. It's a day of prayer because this is the day that we want to make sure that our objectives and our agenda are on the table, are presented before God when he makes those decisions. Now, in the prayer, certainly the Rosh Hashanah prayer, even though it's the first two days of the 10 days of repentance, there really is no mention of any sin. And the reason for that is that the kind of repentance that is done on... Sorry about that. I didn't turn my phone. I usually turn it off. And the reason for that is that the kind of repentance that is done on Rosh Hashanah is repentance by trying to focus on the actual problem and not the symptoms of the problem. Meaning, the reason why anyone does any sin, 
And the reason why anyone needs any repentance is because they've strayed from God, so to speak, in a, in a, in a small way. Because if the notion of God was ever present in their mind, how could they disobey him? So Rosh Hashanah, we focus on the core problem, so to speak, the fact that we don't really have God as our king. And then we dedicate the whole day of Rosh Hashanah, day one, day two, to coronating God. And consequently, that will fix the sin because the sin is just a symptom of that. And therefore, every time we talk about God being a melech, being a king, we accentuate it in our prayers. So, for example, the Shachras prayer begins with the word Hamelech, the king. And there is a, a tradition that the Chazan, that the, the person who's leading the services, the cantor, he begins the prayer and he says the word Hamelech, the first word of, 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 the, of the Shachras prayer, from his seat. And then he would walk. To, to the bima, he would walk to where the chazan stands. And one of the ideas behind that is, today is the day that we're coronating the king. And don't think that you have to be in the front, and you have to be on a pedestal, and you have to be on a stage to be able to declare God's king. You can be in your seat, wherever you are in life. Whatever situation you're in, in your place, in your life situation, you could accept the oath of heaven and you could coronate God. Now again, there's many, many different prayers of Rosh Hashanah. So I want to talk about some of them that are maybe more noteworthy or I, I guess some of the highlights of the prayers. So one of them is, of course, the Unasana Tokef prayer that we say three times a year twice on Rosh Hashanah and once on Yom Kippur. This is a relatively modern prayer. It's only a thousand years old. And it talks about what this day is all about. On this day, the Almighty is going to write the verdict and he's going to seal the verdict on Yom Kippur. And there's a great shofar that's going to be sounded and the angels are terrified. And they're going to say, oh no, today's the day of judgment. And no one could withstand the judgment of God. And all of humanity passed before God like sheep in a flock. And the Almighty's going to count and calculate and consider the soul of all the living, apportion their needs, and inscribe their verdict. And then we go through the verdict. Some of them are going to prosper and upl- be upl- and be uplifted. Some are going to have the opposite of that. Some are going to have tranquility and peace and stability. Others are su- will suffer. All that is decided on Rosh Hashanah and sealed on Yom Kippur by God. We talk about the people. Some people will live. Some people will die. Some people we know, of course. It's, it's very powerful to think about the fact that all the people that died over this year, all of them, it was decided last Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur that they're going to die. It's kind of a scary thing. And then we end off this section, but repentance, prayer, and charity remove the evil of the decree. It's really interesting, a very powerful and evocative portion of the prayer. But it's interesting that humanity is compared to sheep. And the Almighty is having these sheep, and the Almighty is having these sheep, so to speak, pass before him. And each person is going to have his time, his moment of reckoning with God. And the Almighty is going to decide what's going to happen to them live, die, prosper, become impoverished. And then we're told, the repentance, prayer, and charity, they remove the evil of the decree. This is a very similar description to how tithing of animals is done. 
just like there's a tithing with produce and grain, there's also a tithing with animals. So someone, let's say, has 100 new animals in his or her flock on a given year. They have to give 10% of that to God, tithe it. And the way it's done is quite interesting. You take two pens, and you have all the animals in one pen. You have a small door connecting it to the other pen. And you have the animals file by one at a time. And every tenth one, again, you don't decide if it's a big, strong one or if it's a frail, weak one. It doesn't matter. It's random. Every tenth one that passes by, you take a red paintbrush and you slap some paint on that animal. You know that animal is going to be a sacrifice. It's interesting. We have this similar description. Humanity is going to pass before God like sheep. And every few people, the Amai is going to decide this person lives, this person dies. But just like those sheep who are mixing and frolicking with all our pals in the other pen, blissfully unaware that there's a big red stripe on their back and they're destined to be slaughtered as sacrifice. After Rosh Hashanah, after Yom Kippur, we don't get the early results. We don't get the exit polls of Rosh Hashanah. And we have no idea what our future holds. Similar to those sheep, we're just, we're just ignorant. But then we declare teshuva, tefillah, tzedakah, repentance, prayer, and charity, they remove it. These are like the, the paint thinners, paint removers. Who knows if we have a red stripe on our back after the original judgment of Rosh Hashanah. But this is the first days of the 10 days of repentance. And these are days we focus on repentance and prayer and charity. And that's a way to, so to speak, remove that red stripe on our back. Now, one of the other centerpieces of the prayer is the what's called in, in, the, in the Talmud, Malchios, Zichronos, and Shofos, which means verses of kingdom, verses of remembrance, and verses of shofar, of blowing the shofar. And the Talmud tells us that on Rosh Hashanah, we should declare God's kingship and remembrances and shofars on this day. We should coronate God as a king in order that he remembers us and how with a shofar. So this is the centerpiece of one of the centerpieces of the Musr prayer. And it takes up, I would say, a large portion of the Muslim prayer, and it's dedicated towards 10 verses apiece, 10 of God's kingdom, his reign, 10 of God's remembrances, and 10 related to shofars, 10 verses from all of scripture, 10 apiece of each of these three themes. And then we have a special request to coordinate God and to have him remember us positively and uh, to take the lesson of the shofar to heart. Now, it's interesting, this entire process begins with the second, par with the second paragraph of Aleinu. We start, al Kain nikaveh lecha. And that's how this section starts. And it is interesting that the author of that particular citation is none other than Achan, one of the villains of Jewish history, someone who disobeyed the express commandment of Joshua, and he plundered the booty against the rules. And he traditionally is viewed as the author of that particular paragraph of prayer that we say every day. But it's also where we start off this section of the prayer that coronates God. We start off with this 
paragraph. And it's been suggested that on this day, no matter who you are, you could be a villain of Jewish history. You could be someone who disobeyed the commandment, someone who was a rebel, and someone who was executed for their crimes. So this is, again, not, not a great person, not a hero. Nevertheless, everyone has a chance on this day, even the lowest of the low, if they coronate God on this day, if they reach out to God, if they take those steps of repentance, they could turn over their life in one day. Now, of course, on non-Shabbos Rosh Hashanahs, we blow the shofar, and there's a hundred different blasts that are done. Now, there is an iconic statement in the Rambam that we like to read every year, talking about what the purpose of shofar is. And he tells us that even though blowing the shofar Rosh Hashanah it's just a decree of the verse, meaning we don't really need to find reasons for it. We do it because God says to do it. There are mitzvahs that we know. We just do it because that's what we're commanded to do. Nevertheless, there is symbolism in it, as if the chauffeur is saying, wake up, sleeping ones, from your sleep. And wake up those who are in a deep slumber from your slumber and examine your deeds and return to God in repentance and remember your creator. These are the people who forget the truth with all the futilities of time. And they spend their entire year with nonsense, with futility, doesn't help them, doesn't save them. Look at your soul improve your ways and let each one of us abandon our improper path and our improper thoughts. Of course, the shofar is a mitzvah. We do the mitzvah because we're told to do the mitzvah. However, says the Rambam, there's still a very powerful lesson that can resonate with us. And that is that we're sleeping. Of course, we're not actually asleep. But we might as well be, because our soul is dormant within us, because it's not operating, it's asleep. The inmates are running the asylum, as they say. The Sahara and our body are in total control of what happens to us, of what we do in our lives. And we're trying to stir awake the soul. We're trying to get it to murmur and to wake up and to perk up and say, hey, I have a same this as well. And once the soul's been activated, a person's life is totally different. If someone's soul is operational within them, they're a different person. And that is the goal of Rosh Hashanah. And that is the specific goal, says the Rambam, of the shofar to wake up the sleeping giant that is our soul within us. Once we do that, we can turn over our lives in one day. And you know what? One chauffeur blast is apparently not enough. Just like when someone is asleep, often if they're a deep sleeper, they need multiple alarm clocks to wake them up. We do a hundred blasts of the chauffeur and hopefully that will stir us awake. Now, there are many other reasons and symbolisms for shofar. So Rav Sa'ad Yagon, one of the Gonim, so think about a, a sage about 12, 1300 years ago. He enumerates 10 different ideas from shofar. You know, shofar is about, just like when there's a new king, you blow the trumpets. We have a new king, and that is God, and we blow the, the trumpets. And it evokes Sinai, and it evokes Messiah, and it evokes the prophets and their admonitions. It evokes the temple. There are a lot of different ideas that are there in the city, 
that, that are there in the in, in the shofar. So he quotes, for example, a, a verse in in the prophet, Hayitarka shofar ba'ir. Can a shofar be blown in a city and the people not tremble? It's there, of course, to give us also a little bit of trepidation. Because again, there's a certain hallowed sound of the shofar that's designed to get our attention. And the, the shofar blasts are done in, in, in different ways. You know, we have the tkia, which is the long and straight sound. And we have the shivarim, which is three, some people do four, but three short blasts. And then we have the true, which is a bunch of tiny, you know, in rapid fire, rapid succession blasts. And the Talmud, they're described as various, and in the Talmud, these are described as various different cries, that various different sighs. And the tkia is a long and strong and confident. And the shivarim is like broken sounds. And the chirua is like a, it's like a, it's like a, it's a terrible sigh, like a, like a crying sigh. And these are all interwoven together. And again, that symbolizes the duality of the day. It's a day of joy and celebration, but also a day of, of fear and trepidation. And we have on one of the tekiah, and we feel great, and we have confidence, and things are going swimmingly. But we have to also realize that, you know, we have the shivarm and the trua, those other sounds, those shorter, more broken sounds, they're also upcoming. But when we have those sounds, and we may get a little bit melancholic and depressed, good times are right around the corner. And then again, evokes a little bit the dueling themes of Rosh Hashanah, of on one hand trepidation and awe, the other hand celebration and festivities. Now, where does the number 100 come from? Why do we have 100 blasts of the shofar? So there's an interesting citation brought down in the medieval literature. It tells us that the mother of Sisra, Sisra is one of the villains of the Book of Judges, and he was this incredible warrior, and he went to war with the Jewish people, but he was killed. So the verse tells how his mother was waiting by the window, when is her son coming home, Sisra? And of course, we know that he, he wasn't coming home. But our sages tell us that she cried a hundred times in hopes that her son will come back. And therefore, to counter, so to speak, the hundred cries of the mother of Sisra, we have the hundred cries, so to speak, of the shofar. That's what we're told. And it's a very bizarre idea because, you know, what does Sisra and his mother have to do with Rosh Hashanah? And that's a, a subject that everyone talks about. I'm trying to figure out what's going on over here in this very unusual citation. But isn't it interesting that we have to go to the mother of one of our villains to find this idea of a hundred, hundred blasts corresponding to a hundred cries. Couldn't we find some nice old Jewish lady who cried also? Maybe the answer is like this. We're told the mother of Sisra, the mother of this beast, she cried a hundred times. And in heavens, even though she is not a remarkable woman, and of course, not someone who has a great legacy, but even her pain was tallied, was logged, was maintained. And we know she cried a hundred times. And what about us? Yes, we're small people, but our suffering will certainly be registered and logged and maintained in heaven. If the mother of Sisra, if she is someone whose pain and whose cries register, all the more so 
our prayers and our sighs and our cries be registered in heaven. Now, the Talmud tells us that ideally we should use the horn of a ram as our shofar. Many different kinds of animals would qualify, but the shofar, the, the horn of a ram, is the best. And the Talmud says something very interesting. As if the Almighty is saying, if you blow the shofar with the horn of a ram, I will remember the horn of the ram of Genesis. When Isaac is being brought in the episode of the binding of Isaac as a sacrifice, and it stopped in the last second, Abraham finds a replacement, and that is the ram, which is trapped in the thicket with its horn, and says the Talmud, if we blow a shofar on Rosh Hashanah with the shofar of a ram, God will remember the episode of the binding of Isaac, and he will consider, so to speak, as if we ourselves sacrificed ourselves to God. So, of course, that's a very powerful idea, and that is a great incentive. Now, Rosh Hashanah is the blueprint for the year to come. And therefore, we want to make sure that Rosh Hashanah is perfect, is free of any blemishes. And we know that with a blueprint, if you have something that's only an inch off, it's only an inch off, no big deal. But if it's in the blue, but if it's in the blue, but if it's in the blueprint, it could corrupt the entire skyscraper. Because the very small picture of the blueprint of the blueprint is magnified across the final finished product. And, and therefore, we want to make sure that Rosh Hashanah itself, the blueprint for the year, is perfect. So there is an interesting tradition. Even though on Shabbos afternoons we're told that it's encouraged to take a short nap, we don't want to sleep a year. So there's a tradition to not take a nap on Rosh Hashanah afternoon. Moreover, to have maybe some extra prayer, extra Torah study on this day. Many have a custom to recite psalms on Rosh Hashanah. Some people even have the custom to finish the whole book of Psalms, all 150 chapters, once and even twice on Rosh Hashanah. There is also the interesting custom of Tashlich, which is traditionally done after Mincha, the first day of Rosh Hashanah. And that is, it's a very long prayer and declaration that we say next to a body of water preferably a body of water that contains fish. And there's many different reasons given to it as to why specifically on this day to do this practice. Some suggest that when Abraham was bringing Isaac to the body of Isaac, the Satan wanted to stop it. And he made a river blockading Abraham and Isaac. And the major tells us that Abraham entered the water, and when the water got all the way to his neck, he declared, Save me, Hashem. He diyu maim ad nafesh. The waters have reached my soul. And the water disappeared. And when we recite the Tashlech by a riverside, that is another symbolism to evoke the merit of the binding of Isaac. In addition, we're told that it used to be customary when you would coronate a new king, you do it by the riverside to indicate that just like the river is continuously flowing, the kingdom should, should continuously reign. Of course, Rosh Hashanah is the day that we are proclaiming and coronating God as our king. And therefore, we have this process done by the riverside. Now, if you look at the prayer of the Tashlech, the reason why it's called Tashlech, Tashlech means to cast. What we are saying, I think it's quite strange and bizarrely, at least on a, on a simple level, we're saying we want to throw our sins into the water. It's a very strange thing. 
why are we doing that? Why are we throwing our sins in the water? So I had a theory that we could speculate. Our sages tell us that there are different types of repentance. There's repentance out of love of God, and there is repentance out of fear of God. So of course, you know, the, the dual relationships that we have with God, he's our king, he's our father, we love him, and we fear him. But the Talmud tells us that these two forms of repentance are different. When someone has a bunch of sins and they, and they repent, but they repent because they're scared of God. Repentance out of fear. That switches the sins from being willful, intentional, wanton sins to being accidental sins. So accidental sins you're not, you're not held liable for. However, when someone repents out of love of God, that doesn't take all the sins and turn them into accidental sins. That takes those sins and turns them into mitzvahs. Retroactively, those sins get reclassified as merit, as good deeds. So I wanted to speculate. We're taking all sins and trying to, we're saying, like, let's throw them into the water. We know a natural body of water is a mikvah. And what happens in the mikvah? Someone who is impure descends into the mikvah and emerges pure. So maybe what this is hinting at, it's trying to encourage us to try to purify and cleanse ourselves and repent, but repent in a way that our sins are thrown into the water, i.e., they themselves emerge pure, they become mitzvahs as well. That was my speculation. Regardless, there are many rituals and customs and ceremonies and practices that we do on Rosh Hashanah, and all of them are designed to get our attention so that we focus on this day. The verse tells us, Dear Shu Hashem Behimatso, seek out God when he is available, call out to him when he is close. Prayer repentance these are great the whole year round but there's 10 days a year starting from Rosh Hashanah concluding on Yom Kippur that God is close to us and these are days that are swiftly upcoming and these are days that we don't want to squander and that's why there are so many signposts along these days of course, it's not Rosh Hashanah, but throughout the 10 days of repentance as well, that are all there to get our attention. And hopefully we will, now that we know more about these customs and what they're designed to do, we'll take the lesson to heart and make this year the best Rosh Hashanah ever. It's honey. We're being thrown to the honey. We're maybe impure. We can come out pure. It's the day that just like Sarah, Sarah was infertile and she switched. This is the day that we were created. We're going to have a say how we are going to be recreated anew for this upcoming year, the year 5781, the year upcoming. May we all be blessed with Exhibitsimatova. Let us be inscribed in the book of life. Let us be stamped in the book of life. May we have a sweet, happy, healthy new year, a year where only good things happen to us, to our families, to our communities, of course, to our Jewish brethren worldwide. And may this year bring only good tidings, only happiness, only joy. To all of us. My email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing your questions, comments, and feedback. <laughs>